In May of 2009, 3rd Squadron 61st Cavalry Regiment deployed to Nuristan, Afghanistan, a small eastern province bordering Pakistan. When they arrived, they occupied the most fringe outposts of Regional Command East, several of which were only accessible by a helicopter and then, only during the cover of the darkest nights of each month, in order to avoid rocket-propelled grenade attacks against the airframe. The squadron commander for the deployment was then-Lieutenant Colonel Robert Brad Brown. In preparation for that deployment, he, along with then-Colonel Randy George, went on the pre-deployment site survey to better understand the terrain and complex environment of which they were only months away from assuming responsibility. During that trip, they arrived at Combat Outpost Keating, a remote outpost named for Ben Keating, who had died attempting to drive one of the lumbering resupply vehicles down the treacherous road back to the forward operating base. Standing in that base, built in a valley at the base of three mountains and backed up by two rivers, both men understood there could be no delay in closing that base for the safety of their troopers. Anyone who visited Cop Keating knew full well that it was the most tactically indefensible position in which you could ever find yourself. But that wasn't the only conundrum. Cop Keating wasn't alone. In order to close it, you would have to close the other two outposts in the surrounding area almost simultaneously to ensure that they could provide reinforcing fires for one another. Concurrently, south of the forward operating base, one of the observation posts that Colonel Brown would be assuming responsibility for had recently been completely overrun by the Taliban, who attacked up a mountain as the Afghan National Army abandoned their post, forcing the remaining U.S. troopers to call for a broken arrow, requesting fire on their position as they were being overrun. And to complicate all of that, the going in position of relieving the outgoing unit would have them arrayed across a vast swath of land, terribly difficult to resupply, with barely enough troopers to simply pull security on their own position. For multiple reasons, they were unable to close Cop Keating, Opie Fritchie, and Cop Lowell as quickly as they needed to. Unknown to the base closure planners of 361 CAV, as they were planning simultaneously to close the three outposts in Camdash, the Taliban were planning a massive complex attack to prevent them from ever leaving. On the morning of October 3rd, 2009, more than 400 insurgents attacked O.P. Fritchie and Cop Keating simultaneously. A force of only 52 troopers defended Cop Keating even after the Afghan National Army abandoned their post and the insurgents broke through the perimeter, causing a small group of troopers led by Staff Sergeant Clinton Romache to engage the enemy in close quarters combat, retaking the cop. However, at the end of the day, the troopers of Black Knight Troop, 3rd Squadron, 61st Cavalry Regiment, would be saying their final goodbyes to eight of their friends who had given their lives during that battle. The diligent devotion of their squadron commander, however, ensured that this moment would not easily be erased from history. Colonel Brown and his staff worked to guarantee the recognition of the heroic efforts of those who went above and beyond to place themselves in harm's way to protect each other, to destroy the enemy, and to bring the remains of their friends home. Those efforts to ensure recognition succeeded. What has since become known as the Battle of Kandesh resulted in the following awards. Two Medals of Honor for Staff Sergeant Clinton Romache and Staff Sergeant Ty Carter. Two Distinguished Service Crosses for First Lieutenant Andrew Bunderman and Staff Sergeant Justin Gallegos, posthumously awarded. Nine Silver Stars. 18 Bronze Stars with V Device for Valor. 37 Army Commendation Medals with V Device for Valor. And 27 Purple Hearts for Wounds Sustained in Combat. Staff Sergeant Romache authored the book Red Platoon and Jake Tapper authored The Outpost, which has since become a major motion picture. The fallout of the battle, including the loss of life, took its toll on everyone involved and amongst others within the squadron. The subsequent investigation held both Colonel George and Lieutenant Colonel Brown responsible, even though the ISAF commander at the time, General Stanley McChrystal, agreed there was nothing more they could have tactically done to prevent the disaster. Lieutenant Colonel Brown, however, still had eight months left to command his squadron, through a deployment in one of the most kinetic provinces in all of Afghanistan. 
The two artillery guns on his forward operating base fired over 6,000 rounds total during their Yerdong deployment. He had lost two troopers before Keating while sending back home dozens of wounded of troopers before and after the battle for Kamdash. To put it in context, in the first four months of his deployment, Colonel Brown's squadron of ragtag cavalrymen were attacked more than 238 times across seven separate locations. And yet, he persevered with courage, humility, devotion, and determination. It is why those of us who have served with him as the commander for 3rd Squadron, 61st Cavalry Regiment, unabashedly and unquestionably remember him to this day as the best leader we ever served with. As his former chaplain, I can guarantee he's the real deal, and I'm humbled to know him. So without further ado, here's the one and only Brad Brown. Welcome to the Life Giver Podcast. This is Corey Weathers. We have been doing um, a special edition Afghanistan series where I have been attempting to take some of the biggest questions that I feel like everyone has been asking during this whole withdrawal of Afghanistan and everything surrounding that. Like, What are the biggest questions that everybody's asking and trying to process um, after two decades of war there and, um, and try to answer those questions. And so we've worked really hard for this series to not have to do with politics or stating opinions or really doing anything that would polarize our community, really just the deeper underlying questions. And so I knew that as I was thinking about how do I close out the series, how do I, you know, where do we wrap up, right? Because I don't think even things that Afghanistan is going to wrap up anytime soon. But I thought about like, where are we at now? And what are the, what's the biggest question that people are asking? And it's a tough one. It is a doozy, I think. Um, and I don't even know if I've actually put words to what the actual question is, but it has something to do with um, disappointment. It has something to do with um, leadership of what do we do when we are a part of something or even watching something where we feel like something has either gone wrong or there's lots of opinions about that. And then is should there be blame and like just all of those questions of disappointment, um, even when you're part of something and something ends in a way that you didn't want it to end. So there's lots of questions and depending on where you're at and where you're coming from, the question shifts, I think. And so when I was thinking about how to end the series, um, I knew the best person to talk to would be Colonel Brad Brown. We call you still Colonel Brad Brown. Um, he's told me I can call him Brad. I feel very uncomfortable with that, but I'm going to go with it because he's giving me permission. And that's what I was taught by his wife, Susan, when we were with um, 361 Cav back in 2009. Um, if you listen to the previous episode where Matt had a chance to process his feelings about everything, he shared at the end um, just a lot of his amazing memories with with Brad and Susan, and um, I'm even going to link um, to this episode in the supplemental material. I will include. There's a wonderful roundtable conversation that some of the 361 wives had like years ago that I put on the podcast, and they even talk about at that roundtable just how meaningful it was to have the Browns be um, in command and in leadership during such a very difficult season of our life, and just how much we um, have just adored them from the beginning. And so I knew that we needed to bring um, Brad to help us with this last question um, because, and I'm gonna say this part, but um, you know, you've know, you heard us talk about Keating. You've heard us, if you've read Sacred Spaces or any of the other stories that came out of the Battle of Keating, it was a very difficult deployment. It was a very difficult experience for a lot of families um and absolutely the most difficult for our gold star families that went through that and um so in the time that we spent after 361 and after all of that um we were devastated as a community when the investigation concluded and found um colonel brown and colonel now general george responsible at the end of in, the end of the day and that was devastating for all of us because we felt like it was the wrong call and whether brad's going to say that or not i'm going to say that that's something that we struggled with as a community that it we felt it was the wrong call um, and it caused a lot of that disappointment in leadership disappointment in politics disappointment in the whole, all of it just all of it because it was just messy and, um, and I don't know of another way to describe it other than messy. And I think when I look at the Afghanistan situation, it just feels messy. 
So I I asked Brad if he'd be willing to come on and share his story. And so this is not anything about opinions related to Afghanistan in particular, although Brad, you hold so much information in your head about <laughs> Afghanistan and policy and strategy and everything, and perhaps you can help us navigate a lot of stuff. But let me just say, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for trusting me with your story. Thank you for being willing to share it. And that's going to be one of my first questions, but I just want to say welcome. Thank you for doing this. Thanks for having me, Corey. It's a pleasure to talk to you, and it's great to see you again. I hope you and Matt are doing well. We are, and we're only an hour and a half from you, so we have great plans to bring our son and convince him to go to Texas A&M, where you guys are. Um, you are now retired, um, and there was a lot of um, a lot of career shifting that happened um, from 361 on. So I think I would love to just kind of start there, like after after that assignment at Fort Carson, Colorado. Um, can you just kind of walk everybody briefly through where you went from there um, and where you are now? Sure. Um, so af after I left command, which, you know, that Keating was a huge event, but it was it was about a four day sort of ordeal in the midst of a year long deployment. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't it wasn't the only bad day. You know, it wasn't the only hard day. Um, and, you know, that was one for us, you know, our, our squadron, you know, we had, um, we had four other troops that were also in kind of significant contact for throughout the year and had very difficult missions. So, you know, one of the things that's sort of different for me from a lot of the focus on Keating is, is that the scope that we were looking at was so broad and there were a lot of other things and you know honestly go leading into it you know we were tremendously concerned about a lot of places and a lot of the units and we had lost um several soldiers you know including a couple that were very near and dear to me uh before keating um and we continued to fight and we lost soldiers afterwards so um you know that that always shapes my view in a way that doesn't quite to the same extent because uh it was so i think formative and intense for for the unit you know the bravo troop folks that were there um but you know for others that were you know it was my third deployment and i i have traumatic days going back to 2004 um and including in that one and it certainly keating was may have been the, the single most um impactful day over the course of a, a career there's a lot that goes on um and it gives you, I guess, maybe a little bit of perspective where if you're a family member or you were a soldier that were there that day, that may be the defining day of your life. Mm -hmm. um, where some of the others, it, it was one of many, I would say. And it, you know, I kind of have a list of my longest days over the course of my life, and it's one of them, um, certainly, um, but it's not the only one. And maybe that's a good thing. I don't know. Um, but in any case, after Keating happened in October, you know, we were there until May. Mm -hmm. And we, when we left and, and changed command, um, you know, it, we, I was uh, kind of given some options uh, afterwards and l like you kind of do. Um, and you, the thing I would say is a lot of the, the mentors and, you know, leaders who I'd worked for previously afterwards kind of said, hey, what is it that you want to do? Um, and we knew coming out of that, based off how things went, that, you know, whatever kind of you thought your the the apex of your career was going to be, it's probably not going to be that. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, what what's the right situation? Where do you think you want to be? How where do you want to contribute? Because, you know, you've still got a lot of time left in the Army. You know, I was not, um, you know, I came out of command and, you know, was still, you know, still had a lot of years left in my career. And, you know, at that point, I kind of said, you know, we really wanted to have a little balance in our lives after what we'd gone through. I had two kids that were starting high school. Um, and we thought getting to a place where we could go and stay for a couple of years would be helpful to get them all through. And after talking with Sue, we decided that was kind of the most important thing. So we ended up getting a, a position in Washington, D.C. I was coming as a a squadron commander coming out of Afghanistan. Um, I got connected with some folks who worked in um, in OSD policy, which is the civilian side of the Department of Defense. 
um, you know, I, I don't want to get into a big <laughs> discussion of the uh, the giant, you know, ball of twine that is the Department of Defense. But you know, the, the secretary has a civilian staff, and those civilian staff members have military officers, active duty that uh, assist them. And so I was there, and I was a desk officer and an action officer at the lieutenant colonel level in OSD coming out. Uh, and I was on the Afghanistan desk, which at the time that was a major priority for the administration, a major priority for the Department of Defense is to say, what are we going to do with Afghanistan? Uh, they had gone through a major strategic review and um, they had elected while McChrystal was there to surge forces in there and try and um, try and you know achieve some degree of equilibrium that would be acceptable to the country um, that would achieve the goals of going into Afghanistan in the first place. And there's a lot of debate over how to do that um, at the time. So I worked in that office for a couple of years at the strategic level. I mean, about as high as the strategic level you could be um, with, you know, working under uh, then um, Dazdi David Sedney and then um, Michelle Flournoy and, uh, and ultimately uh, uh, Bob Gates, who was Secretary of Defense. And had a lot of you know good, great civilians and, and military folks around me. Um, I did that for a couple of years, and I went to the, the War College um, at uh, Fort McNair. I was in the uh, Eisenhower School, and at that point, I'd been promoted to colonel, um, but I was a, an alternate for the next level of command, and I knew I wasn't going to get one. So they kind of said, "Hey, you know, decide what you want to do." And you know, I still had some drive on left, so. I enjoyed my time in OSD. I wanted to stay in Washington, D.C. to get my son all the way through high school, so I volunteered for another hitch, so I did three more years um, working in force development and uh, plans there in OSD. Afterwards, I, I competed to be the professor of military science at Texas A&M and was lucky enough to get selected to do that, which was a tremendous honor. So my last three years, I was uh, training cadets to become officers at Texas A&M. Uh, and it was a, a tremendous, tremendous opportunity at sort of the twilight of your career to go back and, and have day-to-day -day interaction with non-commissioned officers and those future lieutenants and get a chance to kind of, I don't know, you know, share all your experiences with them and hopefully have a positive impact for that next generation of people that are going to kind of carry forward in the military. So it was a tremendous, I'd say, bright spot in a, a very positive way to end my time and my career and the service that Sue and I had done about 29 years together, um, together really from the beginning. And then afterwards, I stayed on and I'm working at AM now in engineering. So it's been great. Well, I'm, I'm definitely going to ask you by the time we're done, like how, how retirement life feels now with two, yeah. like, I think you have two successfully launched children. Yes. You guys are officially empty nesters, even though you're living in a college town. So I have questions about that. Yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah. when you had gone on to the Pentagon and gone to DC and working in um, the Secretary of Defense's office, did you know um, that the investigation was that during when the investigation was happening? Did you know that it was going to go the direction that it did? What was that so, time like? It, it was already done. That it was done while we were still in theater. So, oh wow! When, after the within um, a month of of the battle, the uh, they had already dead. You know, as people may or may not know, every time a, a soldier is seriously uh, injured or is killed, and whether that's in combat or you know, at, in training or in any circumstance, there there's an investigation that's done. That's, there's nothing unique about that with with Cobb Keating, um, and and every soldier we lost there there was an, there was an investigation that is really done to kind of establish the facts and the circumstances so there's clarity um, and closure is the hope. And if you can learn something as part of the process, you know that's what the Army does for everything. You know and when things go bad, you kind of look at it and say, hey, why did it go bad? Um, what could have been done to prevent it? But sometimes, especially I think with uh, soldiers who are killed, that it's a um, gather the facts because, and you know, it's almost, it's unique in the history of, of mankind right now where for the entirety of human existence, you know, young men and women, you know, go off to fight and in most circumstances, if they're killed, their family never knows what happened. Maybe if they're lucky enough that someone was there who survived, who knew them and cared, 
might come back and say, hey, you know, this is what happened. I mean, you see that in, I think, you know, it's not uncommon to see in historical discussions. It's like, hey, Billy went off the ward. He never came back. And, you know, the last letter I got from him was here. And then we think he died somewhere. And maybe someday you'll find, you know, where he's buried, if you're lucky, in some cases, it, it's a nameless grave <laughs> somewhere. And, you know, in, in the, I think in the aftermath of Vietnam, the country said, you know, we don't believe in missing an action anymore. We're not going to allow people to die and be gone and not know what happened. World War II, there's still Korea, there's still, you know, efforts going on in the government to try and find and identify every single soldier what happened to them. Um, but part of that for the family is also to understand what the circumstances are. So it's not a rumor and you know exactly. And that can be harsh and it can be brutal um, it, to the level of detail that they try and capture exactly what happened. So this, the family member's not guessing um, and can know, assuming they want to know, you know, what those circumstances were. So that, that's nothing unusual in that. But that, that happened, um, started within a month of Keating and it was done in November. And, you know, the, the convening authority for that was General McChrystal, who was the, the ISAF commander. Um, and he signed off on the investigation and issued his, you know, he did what he did, um, made the judgment that's, that he made. Um, and that was done by Christmas. So, so I, that, I, I got to enjoy, you know, you know, that, that kind of period where you're struggling with, um, you know, what came out of that. Uh, and then, you know, it's not over. Mm -hmm. um, the whole time this is going on every day, you've got things to do. You've got a mission to do. And soldiers are continuing to go out and do their best and be put into harm's way. And, you know, you can't get fixated on looking at what's going on or, or those other things. What you can do is say, all right, let's look at everything that happened as calculated as you can and say, what can we learn from this? Um, well, and, and can I pause you there for a second? Because um, to have to have that come out and to see your name as, as being held responsible, I, hate, right. I don't even know the right terminology because I just don't like it. But the point is um, to see to see your name there. Right. And to what was that like to go through that couple of months like the deployment didn't end until may and you're without your spouse right you're there thankfully with soldiers that love you um yeah. who i know for a fact were were arguing against the the con the conclusion of that investigation um yeah. so what was that like for you during that time to get that conclusion the way that it was was it did you feel like that makes sense? Did you feel like that's not, it wasn't fair? Do you feel comfortable talking about that? Like they think there's a struggle yeah. there. Yeah, I, there's always a struggle, but you know, I, I was having a struggle at the time. And I think everybody that's involved is having a struggle because um, you know, the day, when the day it happened, uh, the, the battle happened, you know, I, I got out there, I flew in on um, actually a, a Black Hawk that was with the medevac. Uh, to get the, the first medevac that got on the ground there. And I landed as it, it took off with the, the severely wounded. You know, I flew in right onto the LZ afterwards and got out. And I mean, the, it just kind of started to get dark and, um, you know, the place is still on fire and everyone was walking around, you know, just almost in the days. Mm -hmm. um, Stoney had led down the, uh, the relief column that had landed up at OP Fritchie and they had kind of established a, an initial security perimeter and, and frankly, they were still trying to find um, the last casualty that we didn't know what had happened to him at the time. Um, and you walked into that. So the first step is, hey, let's get everything under control. Let's let's make sure that this we have this situation. We have accountability of everyone. We have a perimeter set up. Everyone's going to be okay from here on. And then, but then the next day, the sun comes out, and um, you know, there's things are still going on. But then you've got to kind of assess what's going on and, and really define what happened. And over the next two days, you know, I walked around and, and met with every soldier that was there and had them take me to their position and say, hey, what did you see? What did you do? What happened to you? Um, you know, what was the experience? And, you know, I was there, you know, kind of taking notes, but I didn't record it. And, you know, I took a couple of pictures just to, um, to, to sort of frame, you know, the reference of what was going on. But it was really just to look every soldier in the eye and, and see how they were. Um, you know, are you, 
what is your state? Are, are you okay? Can you talk about it? Um, and, and just give them some sort of reassurance that, that, you know, we're, that as the commander that I care about where they're at and what they were doing and what happened to them. And it's also, you know, on a personal level for them, but then also just to get a sense of where, where, where's a unit here, um, because th- we're not out of the woods here by any means. So I had a very great idea and understanding right off the bat of everything that had kind of happened and gone on. And then over, over the course of the next couple of weeks, you know, when we did finally, you know, get out um, and we, we closed the place and took care of things, um, we had a series of kind of sessions at each level. And you got to see at that point, after that initial day of being totally, sh- you know, shell shocked, really, mm-hmm. and um, people had started to to come to terms with things. And what you saw across the board was anger and guilt. Mm-hmm. Um, anger that at a lot of things, and you know, striking out at whatever. Um, people were looking in some ways to um, themselves say who. who who is at fault for this? Who, who caused this to happen and these people to die? And at the same time, they have that almost everybody that was there feels a tremendous sense of guilt because someone they knew died and they didn't. And what could I have done differently that would have allowed that to happen? So, um, you know, I had met separately with all the soldiers, separately with all the NCOs, separate with the leadership in a couple of different sessions and had some very candid conversations and said, all right, you know, let's go around the room and let's talk, you know, and, and get it out. Don't, don't hold this for 10 years um, with your anger that this didn't happen or this didn't happen. And a lot of people said, hey, you know, this person did this and this is why. And this person didn't do that. Or, and I, I kind of said, okay, well, here's what I want to shape this. Everybody in here, tell me right now. And this is a technique that you know, we did in the army back when I was a captain. And I don't remember which of my leaders was big on, you know, sort of started this. And it may have been just, um, then Colonel, probably then Major Abrams, but I, I don't recall if it was him or not, but it may have been. And it's like, what did I fail to do? Okay, let's don't start pointing fingers around the room, but let's look back and say, honestly, what is getting at you right now and say, what is it that I failed to do? And I start. And hey, here's a list of things that, that looking back in hindsight, I, I failed to do. Now let's go around there and everybody, everybody put themselves out here before anybody else starts doing this. Because everybody that's on there, especially if you're a leader, and this is really more with the leaders than it was with the soldiers. Um, hey, if, if, if you feel like that, that, that there wasn't something right, then as a leader, what did you do about it? And, um, and that's about when you say accountability, you know, who do you hold responsible? Well, you can only really hold yourself responsible. Um, where does the buck stop? Right. And as, as the commander of the unit, they always say, Hey, whatever, whatever happens, um, or fails to happen is your responsibility. So that was kind of the going in position that I started with. Um, and you know, my role, my mission, my focus was to make sure that everybody that was there that came out of this, um, was gonna survive it and was going to be able to cope emotionally with what happened and was gonna be able to reset themselves for the task at hand because we weren't done. And no, you know, unless they were evac from theater, nobody's going home. Mm -hmm. And we got another eight months and we got things to do. So let's get it out, let's learn from it. And and the chips will fall where they may, but in the interim, nobody else, we gotta make sure that everyone else comes out, comes home. So um, and that's you kind of where I went at. So would you say you compartmentalized a lot of it? I think you have to. Yeah. I, I mean, as when you're whether you're a squad leader or whether you're the battalion commander, you know, you can't sit around um, crying over spilt milk or it, or you know staring at your own navel, you know, analyzing your own feelings, um, and you know, woe is me for because bad things happened to my unit because. I mean, I'm intact. I didn't lose any family members. Um, I lost people I cared about. And, um, but in the end, I'm responsible for a lot of people. And, and I just didn't have time to dwell on it. Not that I didn't think about it. Um, but, 
you know, the message was, hey, do tell the truth. Write down everything that you know you want to say. When you write that sworn statement, make that sworn statement the absolute truth, and it's unvarnished. And um, you know, I, I'll say what I think, and everyone says what they think, um, and let the army study it, and it'll be what it'll be. And it doesn't matter because what matters is we can't bring anybody back, but we can certainly try and help keep anybody off from being lost. And you know, I would say at the time, I'd been in the army for. I don't remember now, do the math, 18 years. And I'd been surrounded by um, great leaders. Honestly, I was in great units. And even the ones I didn't like all that much generally had knew more than me and had a lot to teach me if I could just get over myself and, and listen. Um, so I had a lot of faith, honestly, that the army would do the right thing by us. And they would, you know, they would look at this and, and um, it would be okay, you know, so the last thing I wanted to do is kind of go into a defensive mechanism and try and justify um, or sort of, I, I don't know. I mean, I, well, I just didn't I, want to go into that in, in a position where, um, hey, let's all go into defensive mode to try and cover ourselves because I didn't think we'd done anything wrong. I mean, I think everyone, everyone had trained, everyone was ready. Um, everyone there fought to the best of their ability. Um, in an awful situation, awful circumstances, the soldiers showed tremendous bravery. Uh, the leaders, you know, showed tremendous capability and took a, an almost impossible situation and held the ground. Mm -hmm. And you know, and the, I tell you, the Taliban took it a lot worse than we did. Mm -hmm. I'll assure you that. And that was what the message I was saying is: Hey, we didn't lose. I mean, this was a position we never should have been at. We had done our best to get out of it. Um, we weren't able to, um, and we were left kind of holding the bag. But in the end, you know, we left on our own terms, and um, you know, we punched them in the face, and we held the ground, and and got everybody out that we could, and everybody came out. You know, not all of them, unfortunately, survived to get home to see their their families, but we didn't leave anybody behind. And they should, every one of them should be proud of what they did. And that was really the message I was trying to get to. Yeah, learn from it. Let's figure out, you know, you got to learn from everything. Um, but don't hang your heads. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the other thing we did right off the bat, and part of this was that effort of talking to everyone is figure out who did the truly heroic things. And we're going to recognize them. And I'm not going to be shy about it. And I'm not going to sort of say, oh, this is a terrible day and, and we're just going to bury it. No, I mean, we're going to. We are going to recognize it and celebrate heroism and those who who went above and beyond to bring their fellows home. And you know, Matt Campbell, RS1, uh, did a tremendous job. Stoney did a tremendous job. The NCOs, MRXO, um, did a tremendous job in sort of making sure that we had a process and we recognize those soldiers. And you know, the Army, to its credit, although I, I'll tell you, it, <laughs> it took some work. Um, to its credit, it did. And in the end, I think 361 was one of the most decorated units um, in the Army. But, you know, everyone will say, you know, nobody wins a Medal of Honor on a good day. Yeah. I say, you know, is there, you know it just doesn't, that's the nature of the things. But um, the, the way you cope is to focus on what you can, fix what you can, recognize um, those who did amazing things. And then, you know, stay, stay oriented on, on the things you have to do. And you, know, you can't worry about how it's going to, it's going to affect you personally. I mean, you do. You do. Well, okay. So I love all of that. I love all of that. And I think that um, we can apply a lot of that to what we're seeing now, right? Like I, we keep saying, sure, you know, things aren't ending the way that we would have liked for them to have ended. But look at what I mean, I've been saying for the last two weeks, I didn't right. even realize as a family member, the what the Taliban was capable of until I saw it systematically take back over the country. And I think the first yeah. thought I had was, we've been holding that off for two decades. <laughs> like yeah. that is like heroic and, and amazing to me, right? And that those, I think it's a good message to remember, like what are the heroic things? What are the things that we can walk away and be proud of is a way to reframe 
Um, you know, we can focus on these things over here that we're disappointed by. It doesn't mean that we ignore them completely because we have to deal with them. But I think it does shift our focus to reframe and go, what are the things that we're really proud of? And how do we give more energy and focus to that instead? Yeah. But I, I want to um, take you to back to the ball that we had, the, which was the most amazing um, celebration I think I've ever had in my life for us to all celebrate everybody being home and the end of that deployment. Um, but to this day, Matt still has a copy of your speech at the ball. Um, he references it all the time. Um, it is a constant reminder for us, and it's been a huge gift for our family when times have been really difficult, which we have definitely had some of those, to remember that um, it is an honorable profession. It is, it is the calling of our life to do what we do. Um, but to always remember that at some point that that job is going to end and at some point we have to have something else that we focus on. And I don't know if these were your exact words, but they're the words that Matt keeps saying to me in my ear, um, according to what Colonel Brown said at the ball, um, that at some point remember that Big Army won't love you anymore. There's a point at which um, Big Army may not love you anymore. And so what was that experience like for you to devote so much time and energy for your family to give so much yeah. to the institution and to this lifestyle and yeah. then for things to end differently? Um, you know, it, it had, it wasn't, it wasn't so much um, the question of career and, and where I retired or what jobs I got, because that's the whole thing is that, you know, everybody gets passed over. And this is not, I, I didn't coin that phrase. I mean, that's something everyone will always tell you in the army. Hey, there's two kinds of people, you know, and we, it's officers we're talking about. It's true, not quite officers as well as there's two kinds of officers in the army. Those have been passed over and those are going to be. Mm -hmm. um, so it just at some time it's going to end. And, you know, I've known lots of three-star generals who were bitter as hell because, you know, I didn't get that four star and the rest of the army is like, are you kidding me? You know, really? And uh, you, your your career's a failure because you didn't you weren't one of the eight guys that made that level or guys or gals. And so, you know, it's sort of expectations and ambition and all that. And that that's part of being in the army. That's part of being competitive, uh, of being the kind of personality that wants to go and compete and thrive in that kind of environment. And it's an up or out kind of environment. Um, so you're always going to face disappointment. So it wasn't necessarily. You know, in the end, I was still promoted. I still got to the next level. And again, I, I'm not the victim here, and there's no woe is me to that. Um, but what, what really, what it was is that when I, you know, I got a little reprimand out of this, mm -hmm. and it's not my first one. <laughs> Most of it was for me being a, you know, a knucklehead. Um, but it's minor. It's a tool that the army uses to tell you, hey, you know. This is kind of serious and you might want to think about it um and that's you know you, you start with counseling and it happens and i've had leaders i very much respected you know have to put some on paper where i had done something or failed to do something and and you know usually it's not a big deal it's 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 a local deal but you feel feel very profoundly wow you know i i didn't do what i need to do and but the letter that i got you know from from general mccrystal you know it had the words dereliction of duty in it mm. And that's, that is something that um, struck me as one, you know, profoundly unfair, really. Um, but that really, it's not that, hey, you made a mistake mm -hmm. or that um, you were distracted or you should have been, you were doing this, but you should have been doing that. Um, you, you made a bad choice um, or even an error in judgment, say. Dereliction of duty uh, is, is, a, is a profoundly powerful accusation to make. Mm -hmm. And given the circumstances we were in, that sense of anger to me personally and betrayal, because it wasn't just to me, and it was, it was to our subordinate leaders, you know, it was to, to then Colonel George. Um, and given that I knew what we were trying to do was the right thing to do, you know, even Joe McChrystal had told me it was tactically the right thing to do. And, you know, we were left in a position where we, you know, we were in an untenable position. And then this happened. And then to go back through and, 
you know, kind of take some analysis of, you know, various factors and say, well, this was dereliction of duty. That was so profoundly wrong. Mm -hmm. Um, and it hurt. And I mean, I will never give over that. Uh, you know, okay. Now I got to put that on a shelf because that's just me. Um, and I'm not going to let that affect what everything else that has to happen. But, um, but can we I, not skip over that for just a second, right? Yeah. Because there's not to make you like swim in all of your emotions, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Cause I know you don't want to do that, yeah. but I mean, there's a, there's a process of like, how do you take that feeling of feeling wronged, feeling yeah. misunderstood, right? To feel misunderstood, to feel like, um, yeah. how do you, how do you go through that process of thinking? And I, I know you said that's something you'll never fully yeah. be able to get over, but how, what was that process like for you to hear those words and to wrestle with that and, um, and deal with yeah. your disappointment in that letter and McChrystal writing those words yeah. and. Well, he wrote them and then he, and then, and then the, if he filed it and said, well, I'm just, I, I'm not going to put this in your file. So I'm going to tell you that, but then I don't really mean it. And I, I'm going to put it in the trash can, which that was kind of him to do that. Um, and I think what happened really is that more information came to light after the initial investigation was done by you know, folks who weren't there and weren't familiar really with what was going on. They were given a list of questions. They answered the questions. They made a recommendation with, you know, not a whole lot of context. And in the end, General McChrystal kind of looked at it holistically. And frankly, a lot of people had been reporting and said, hey, you know, there's more of the story here than what came out in the investigation. So um, you had people when it first came out and a lot of people were saying, hey, wait a minute. You know, this this isn't right. And this is what was going on. And so right off the bat, there were other people, as, as I'm kind of, you know, grappling with this, that came out and said, this is wrong. And th they were doing the things they were supposed to do. And, um, you know, General George, you know, absolutely defended us to the, to the end um, and said, you know, that this is absolutely wrong and put himself at, you know, personal and professional jeopardy um, to do that. Not everyone in the chain of command did. Um, you know, soldiers said, hey, you know, this isn't right. You know, the subordinates that were not on that sort of blame line for were, were telling me personally, you know, you cannot take this to heart because um, it's not right. Um, and so you kind of talk to people that you respect. You know, you, you got to look at it yourself and say, is it? And make your own judgment and, and kind of come to terms and realize, you know, are there things I could have done better? Absolutely. Um, but then... You know, I had the reassurance of my friends and you know, superiors and subordinates that kind of said, "Hey, um, you know, don't 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 hold this against yourself, um, even though you know part of you always will." And that's important. I mean, it's I think important to remember when you see that. What tends to happen is if somebody gets put in that position and something happens and it happens bad to them, they a lot of times they get kind of pushed to the side and they're kind of a pariah. No one wants to be seen with them. No one wants to talk to them. Um, and they don't want to bring it up because they don't want, they think, oh, you're going to, it's just going to make you sad again. So people ignore it. Um, and it's much better, I think, to confront it. And if, if, if bad things happen to someone you care about to tell them, Hey, look, you know, this is not you, or, you know, I, I still love you. You know, you're still my friend. You're still my, you know, my, my, colleague and my comrade and you know we share a bond and um no matter what happens you know i'm still going to be there and having so many people come and do that for me has, has helped me deal with it and cope with it just this week you know i was together with a lot of my friends um at uh, general abrams retirement all a bunch of old retiring colonels and um you know we process a lot of things and we're together and we tell the same war stories but we reassure each other um that you, you've got You've got people in the army and in life that care about you. And that was really, you know, the kind of thing at the ball. I was, I remember that, you know, of course, of course, I'm baffled that anyone remembers any speech given to anything, which was that, you know, as an institution, the army is there to defend the country. And, and it has people that work within the army, soldiers, 
that have to fight and some of them are going to die. And everyone in the army is expendable to the greater purpose that the army has. It cannot take what happens to Brad Brown personally. Um, and it's not that it, it can't care, but institutions don't have emotions. Um, they don't have friends. You know, they have they have a purpose that's you know codified in, in law and in, in in regulations and sort of the, the founding of the country, and they have to do it. Um, so it's but it's the people in the army that have to care for each other. And that was what I wanted. To, so don't worry that the army found you wanting or didn't it didn't turn out the way you want. What matters is that all the people that are in the room here um, care for each other now and, and going forward. And you know, you got a bond. It's you know, you go through something hard and you survive it together. And um, that's something that will always bind you and let it be a strength to everyone. And that's kind of what I wanted to say and kind of how I felt, and I still feel that way. Um, and it's what what gets me through, and I hope it what gets everyone through. Um, you know, there's that's it's you know suicide is a huge thing in the army. It, it, it's gone up um, from when I was a lieutenant back in the days when soldiers had lower suicide rates than the uh, the general population. Now it's you know we're off the charts, and I I don't nobody knows why we try. It, everyone's baffled, but you know my sense is that more people you know were there for each other. Um, in positive ways and remind them, hey, you know, I care about you and you're, you're my brother and you're my sister and, you know, we have a bond and you can't do it with everyone. Um, but those that are close to you, find that group and, and stay together and support each other um, and value what you all did. And don't worry about what happens with the institution. It'll carry on because it has to. Well, and one of the messages that I'm hearing you say is don't let the institution define who you are. The people around you have a better sense of your character of um of your work ethic of of just how much they love you and i think that when we are focused on um, whether or not we can change the institution or what the institution thinks about us it's kind of like it's not a it's not a healthy relationship and at the end of the day i think that's what you were trying to say is that yeah. that's not what it can be, that's not what it should be about yeah. it's going to be a really difficult road if that's where we're focused our attention on um you know, I, I definitely don't want to end our time together because um, we could go on for a very long time on all different <laughs> kinds of things. And Matt yeah. has, has definitely warned me of getting into this territory of policy with you um, mm -hmm. because you're a big brain on this. But, <laughs> um, you know, I I think it's important to hear from you. You know, once you went to the Pentagon and you you almost this is my understanding of it. You can you please correct me if I'm wrong, mm -hmm. but when we were on that deployment, you were really boots on the ground, you know, living out the strategy that was either yeah. given to you or making that strategy as you needed to, um, and definitely as you trained to, right? Um, but once you went on to the Pentagon, there's a higher level, of, like point of view from yeah. a policy level, from a military strategic level. And so it's a very interesting, unique place for you to be in where you um, were boots on the ground, living out what those orders are, policy even, um, yeah. playing out and you following those strategies versus you now in the Pentagon after this investigation has also come out, right? Yeah. Um, seeing the policy from a different angle. So can you share what that was like for you to see those two different sides of things? And, and maybe could you apply yeah. that to how people are trying to understand and comprehend what's going on with Afghanistan yeah. now? Yeah. Uh, and, you know, it was interesting because, you know, I was there. I. And I think a lot of people, not everyone, but certainly for our unit, when I left, I thought the area where we were was tangibly better. I mean, you know, you could see things that were better than when we got there, that were better than they were two years ago from, you know, from the state of the economy, from the number of kids that were getting educated, from the economic activity that was going on there, the infrastructure that had been built up. Um, and you saw little you know, islands of this progress at different places. And you come out and you say, you know, you're kind of hopeful that this is going, you know, that there's going to be some success there. Mm -hmm. um, and you, you, and maybe you fixate on those positives to tell yourself, hey, you know, we're, this is worth it, that there's value in doing it and the sacrifices, you know, paying dividends. I mean, you know, just, hey, there's, there's a bunch of girls in school over there. And is that something, you know, does that, is that something that 10, 20 years ago is some of the seeds for, later that's going to matter. Um, but you also saw at the time where um, that thing happening at the community level, at the command level between me and my police chief counterpart and my district government counterpart, that's all fine. 
but it doesn't permeate up that you weren't seeing that same thing kind of at the province and the middle levels. Um, and you, you struggle to know why. Uh, and then, you know, I got to the Pentagon and I'm working from the top down and you're working at the national levels of government. You're talking about foreign policy with the state department and the higher level strategy to develop the security forces and equip them and arm them and, and come up with a policy for how things work. And you, you start reading about you know, the creation of the Afghan government and the power of the Afghan government from the top down, and you understand the figures at the national level. And you, you kind of see that you, know, you have this and you have this, and there's no connective tissue between those things. Mm -hmm. um, and there's reasons why it ended up being that way um, that I won't get into in too much in depth. Of course, it's my opinion. Mm -hmm. But what I came out with it after two years of working on the Afghanistan desk is like, this is not going to work. Mm -hmm. um, it, it will never connect because it was flawed in design from a governing standpoint. Um, and some of that had to do with aspirations that you go in, you invade a country, you try and fix it. You never want it to happen again. You know, that's, you know, the role of Al Qaeda in, in 9-11. And so you say, well, the, the way to fix it is you, you change the fabric that result in this happening. And you try and figure out a way to do it. And, you know, there's no, there's no map to do that. There's no understanding. Um, but when, when you're kind of doing it, everyone who's involved gets to put their opinion on the table when you're, when you're creating that plan. And you, you've seen how brutal the Taliban are. Um, you see how the oppression of women, you've seen the issues with human rights, um, the, the brutality of people. And, hey, well, this should be important. We should, we should have rights for women. We should have education. We should have these things. And you're saying, okay, well, is that achievable within the Joe framework of where Afghanistan is? Well, no one's asking whether it's achievable. This is an aspirational goal. And the aspirations, I think, were never something that could be delivered through military force there. You can make things better at the local level, but when you start saying, does Afghanistan have itself the capability to govern itself like it's Germany? And the answer is no. Um, and it may not for generations. Um, and so... I came out of that saying it's just a matter of time. And the question is how how when it when it breaks, how badly is it going to break and can it be put back together afterwards? Because it was going to take breaking for everyone to recognize th that the, the structure we have won't function. Um, and I think you know the problem with that is, is no one wanted to admit it. You know, I, I coming out of that, I really felt that it was just a matter of time before the government had to collapse because it wasn't self-sustainable and it never would be um, in the absence of a, a, a giant military and economic presence from the West. Um, and it's tragic that it happened the way that it did. Um, I don't, I haven't talked to anyone kind of of my peers and people I know that were there and served there that thought we should stay in Afghanistan any longer mm -hmm. because everyone felt that it was really inevitable. Um, and they were happy that, hey, we're out. Mm -hmm. And that's not to say you want to abandon the Afghan people. But um, in the end, you know, if the Afghan people universally thought and, and looked at things the same way that we did, there would be a Taliban. But they don't. And, and they're still coming to terms with what it means to be a Muslim, with what it means to be an Afghan, with what it means, what, you know, your culture and society, what it should be. Um, and the Taliban aren't necessarily that ideologically different than the average Afghan once you get out of that center of Kabul and the, the, the Western educated sort of cosmopolitan class in Afghanistan. The bulk of the, the regular Afghans, hey, they go about their day and you know what? This person, that person, it's the same to them. Um, and w when you see that, why prop this up? at cost of lives, at tremendous cost of money. Um, and now you have to figure out how to cope with it in the aftermath. Now, that's not to say that everyone saw the way it ended and said it could have been done better. Mm -hmm. You know, that it didn't have to be as chaotic as it was and as catastrophic as it was. And that's where now the finger pointing will start. And, you know, the justification memoirs will come out the, the, the backbiting and eventually more of the facts will be understood of who decided to do what and why. Um, and, you know, the military leadership is in a very difficult position. Um, they have to do their own analysis to say, what, what, 
what do I own about this? What did I fail to do? What could I have done differently to make this go down in a different way? I, well, I mean, can, we weren't. Well, and, can you describe but, but Let me just. You, yeah, please. Just to, to finish the thought on that. Um, but the same as where me as a commander, I, I was not going to go to the Washington Post, you know, in person and say that, you know, hey, this is someone else's fault. Mm -hmm. you, you know, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff can't come out and say, you know what? You know, hey, we got we got handed policy constraints that were unworkable to do this in good order. Um, and we came up with a plan that, you know, hey, was kind of a Hail Mary and we hoped it might work. But, hey, this was a constraint. He can't say that. Um, he would never say that. No, no senior military leader is going to come out and and blame civilian officials, um, even if the civilian officials are not saying not saying they deserve the blame. But if they even if they were, you're not going to get that. So those who are saying I demand accountability of the military leadership to come out and throw someone under the bus, that's not how the system works, and that's not how the military serves our country or its elected officials. You know that the, the ballot box holds elected officials accountable. And then you know the military leaders are accountable to, to to civilians and their and their superiors, and over time the truth will come out and you know we'll see who made what decisions where, um, and you know hopefully learn from it. Well, and um, can you that's share, all you can do. Can you share what that? That's exactly what I was going to ask you anyway. So I'm so glad that you took it there. Yeah. Um, can you share what that's like to be a leader and to carry that burden of responsibility? Yeah. Well, I mean, I've talked to some of them lately and, you know, in some cases that there's a, you know, there's some seeding about it that, you know, um, that people, you know, you kind of want to get out and say your opinion of, hey, this is my take on this and you can't, um, that, um, but, you know, the, People, I mean, you, you, when you've been in the army, and some these folks have been in the army for 30, 40 years, and so they they understand that uh, what the chain of command means, and they understand uh, what civilian control of the military means, and they understand that, um, you know, what publicly what you can and can't do. Um, and I think it's hard, but at this point, they they kind of generally understand it. And I, I know it's difficult. If you've been in if you've been in the army for you know 39 years, you know like this is this is my going. This is, this is the last thing that's going to happen. You know, if you're General Milley, this is the last thing you know that I'm going to be remembered for is this absolute chaotic exit of Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure he, I don't, I, you know, um, I don't. I wouldn't say I know him personally at all, um, but I'm sure that it, it's hard mm -hmm. um, because he feels responsible. Um, I'm sure he analyzes the things. What could I have done different? What could I have done better? Um, and I'm, I will guarantee you that, you know, there weren't 10 people that sat in a room and said, Hey, let's, let's do this in, in a way that everyone looks at and says, that doesn't make any sense mm -hmm. um, in the, in, in hindsight. Um, but why was it done that way? And, you know, there are, there are reasons. Um, they may not be good. They may have been wrong. Um, they may have been political. Um, but in the end, you, you kind of have to, you do the best you can with the situation that you're dealt with. And I'm sure it, it's galling and it, it's frustrating. Um, but guess what? You know, that's w when you're a senior leader, that's the responsibilities that you signed up for. Right? Well, and I, it's a great burden. And I think you've described it really well, what it's like to want to be able to say things, even, even things that are from your heart, but you filter that out as an adult, right? And you filter it out as a leader. Um, and you filter it out to say, you know, what's in the best interest of of the American people or my the troops that I, I'm working with or whatever, right? Yeah. So it's a burden to carry the emotions and the thoughts and um, the responsibility even um, of the decisions that you have to make along the way and hope that yeah. you're doing the best that you can with what you've got. Um, so I can't even, um, and that's why I wanted to have you on because you've you've been at almost every layer or level of this kind of situation you have, You've been through a lot of it. You've been in command. You've had to make some difficult decisions. Um, you've had to ha be a part of an investigation. You've had, you know, reports come out of people pointing fingers and it, and it also pointing fingers in a way that was really hurtful too. And then what do you do with that? And then I know you've taken a long time before you, you shared some of the, your feelings about that. What would you say to a leader, let's say a military leader 
who um, who is carrying that responsibility and they're carrying a lot of that burden. And maybe they're listening today and they're they're doing the best that they can with um, whatever level of command or authority that they have. Um, and especially given that we're in a cancel culture, which is just sad, right? We're just, mm -hmm. I mean, it's one thing you've got numerous articles that were published about the findings of Keating, right? And and that's painful. It's almost like this public shaming that happens that I cannot no. even imagine what that's like. And so what would you say maybe to some of the military leaders out there who might be listening, who are carrying that burden of responsibility? Now that you're on the other side, into retirement, yeah. past, yeah. not past, like over it, right? But like having some distance from it. You know, the first is, you know, that I would tell them that um, it, it's it's easy to 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 be responsible and accountable um, when it's easy. Mm -hmm. So you know that that really is the burden of, of command and, and leadership is that um, in the end, you know somebody has to somebody has to say the buck stops. You know, um, and it it may not be fair. Okay, fine. You know, it's not. Um, but what's your real responsibility? You know, because there, your responsibility is not to come out of your job with great career prospects and make it to the next level so you can keep your ambitions alive. That's not what that's not what you're commissioned to do. That's not what your oath says. I know it sounds trite to say that. Oh. Um, but you know, I think sometimes too many people do. You get lost in your career. Um, and you kind of you say you mouth the words. Do you really do you really mean them? Mm -hmm. um, because in the end, um, no nobody cares. You know what your you know what rank you retired at, or you know what your OER says. No one's going to read them. You're never even going to read. Well, I hope you don't um, read them. Um, but you know, did can you look back and say you know I I did the best I could. And I, I, I came out of my experience with my honor intact and my integrity intact. And well, people, and you know, honor, that's honor is not something that you that that you can generate for yourself. That has to be given by others. That that's a, that's a respect that other people are gonna look at you and say, that person is honorable. They're worthy of of honoring. And um, in the end, you know. I care a lot less about what the army thinks about me or what my, uh, you know, what my terminal rank was or what my OER say than I do about, you know, the people that work for me and were with me and that were in combat and say, you know, I, um, you know, I wouldn't throw him a life preserver if he was drowning. Um, or do they say, you know, uh, that's someone that I respect. And that that I was happy to be in that unit with that person because um, they cared and they mattered and they were somebody that in some way I would like to be like. And I had those leaders when I was younger, and that was the kind of leader I wanted to be. Um, and so that's what I would tell them is, you know, act. So when you're 20, 30, 40 years ago, are you going to look back with how you acted, how you responded, how you behaved? And are you going to respect yourself? Um, because you can't control what happens outside that, but you can control what you do in the hope that, you know, that you live by those words that you say from the day you join the army. Um, and that would be it. Well, and we would say that has been the most remarkable thing to watch you and Susan um, live graciously and with humility and um, the way just watching you guys navigate all of that. Um, was something that we just all respected and admired and were impressed by and hope to live up to like it was um, I, I cannot imagine what those years were like for you guys. Um, and like you said, not just because of Keating, but because of the whole career and the lifestyle and everything that it asks for any from any of us to do this lifestyle, but especially um, with the way things kind of wrapped up for you guys. And so I guess my last question for you then is. You know, we've been talking a lot about in this series, um, it seems like the theme has been, you know, we could listen to all the opinions outside the media, everybody's trying to define this or that or put labels on things and express opinions. But I think at the end of the day, we have to create our own meaning. 
we have to create our own um, thoughts about what we think about our time or about that day mm. or about that battle and and decide for ourselves what that means um, and try to bring meaning to it and purpose from it. And so yeah. when you look back over the last of, over your whole career, um, but especially maybe the the most painful parts, how do you create meaning out of that now? I know that's a big question, but like, what do you, what do you wake up every day and are excited to do to bring purpose to some of the toughest moments that you went through? You know, I, I kind of look back and, um, you know, one, I, I just feel have blessed to survive it. You know, I, I feel, you know, that you know, there is that sort of sense of guilt that some didn't, um, and that, um, you know, you hope that you can, you know, live your life in a way that, um, that, that is worthy of, of, of others that were with you and beside you and, and didn't come back. Um, you know, that, um, I think, you know, when you say, what does it mean to, to have, you know, purpose in your life, you know, you, you have to find things that matter to you and they're important to you and they give you joy. And, and everyone has different things. Um, your friends, your comrades, your family, um, you, you know, whether it's in it, it's religion or your work um, and you find that and, and you, you, you know, you're the same person there that you were before and you don't let it change you or damage you, or I think really sour you um, on, on life. Um, and, and you know, bad things can happen, but you, you, you can't like that, you know, change the person that you are. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I was trying to think of some kind of analogy uh, about this. And, you know, I think of all the people that give time and effort of themselves to help others and whether they, they work, you know, with, with disadvantaged children or if they're, if they, you know, work with alcoholics or, or drug addicts or, prisoners or people that, um, that need help um, and that are coming in difficult situations. And they give it themselves and they volunteer and you know, they, they sacrifice and, you know, and it doesn't work you know, all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and that person that you put your, your heart and effort and you do your best for, and then uh, and they OD or, or they, they you go back and they, they commit another crime and they go to prison. And that person has to say, you know, am, am I, a, you know, did what I do, the sacrifice they made, the effort I put into it fail just because it wasn't the outcome that, that I wanted. And I don't think you can look at life that way, that, you know, not everything is going to work out. And, you know, that the effort and the, the sacrifice and, and the blood and the people that we did to try and help that country, um, you know, the same as I think when people look back at Vietnam and say, we, you know, we fought and so many people died and it was so destructive and d damaging to our country um, and it wasn't worth it. And but was it a waste? Mm. And, and I think, it, you know, if you're sincere of what you're doing and you're trying to, to if you're sacrificing of yourself and the country sacrificing of its resources and its people to try and do something good. And I, I think our country is honestly, and its leaders, whether you agree with them politically on both sides of the aisle, are trying to do what they think is the right thing. And it doesn't work out. And it, it ended in a very ugly way. But it doesn't invalidate the effort mm -hmm. and the sacrifice, even if it didn't turn out the way it was designed and you didn't achieve it. Um, that doesn't mean that it was that those people died for no reason or, or that their lives were wasted. Um, and I guess you know, you don't know, but certainly you hope, as I kind of mentioned, that the seeds you saw at the, at the local level and those small successes, someday will that matter? And that 20 years from now, okay, the Taliban's in charge now, but hey, people have seen the outside. People have gone to school. They're more educated people in Afghanistan, 10 times more than there were in, in, in 2001. Mm -hmm. um, and hey, some of them are going to leave. Some of them are going to flee, but guess what? Some of them are going to go back. Mm -hmm. Um, and they're going to say, you know what, there's another world and there's another life and it's not this. And uh, and you've seen a taste of it and then you've lost it. And then will the Afghans themselves say, you know what, this isn't what where we want to be. Um, and, you know, hey, let's judge whether we succeeded or failed in, in 20 years or 30 years or 40 years. Um, and maybe perspective will be different. 
you know, that you find every country, most countries that the United States goes to war with eventually, um, we become friends with. And, you know, whether that's Japan or it's Germany, or frankly, if it's Vietnam. Mm -hmm. um, and so maybe even if we're, we, you know, we have a lot of hubris and we think we can do more than we can and we have a degree of arrogance or whatever, I think, you know, they also uh, see the true heart uh, in, in the caring of, of Americans to say, hey, I'm going to leave my family and go do this and, and do the best I can. I may do it in a bad way or ham-handedly or violently in a way that may hurt folks, but the intention is there. And, um, and it's because people want what we have in the United States and other people to have it. Um, and I believe in our country and I believe in, in, in its people. And we're in a rough time and a lot of people think they hate each other, but the fact is we're not as different as we all think we are. Um, and sometimes the small differences are, you know, the fights are most violent. So that that's what I hope. Um, that's how I I I, I think about um, what matters and what we did and and the values and the sacrifices. Um, and you know, and I hope others will will you know can find something and look at that in a, a similar perspective that um, lets them value their loss. Um, or just the struggles they've gone through. Um, thank you for being vulnerable to share your story. And um, I can tell you that um, you have raised up an incredible generation of leaders. Um, I look at Larocque over there in Germany doing amazing things that he's doing. And I look at my own husband and the impact that you've had in his life. And I think about the ROTC students that you worked with at Texas A&M and I, I wish I could just go find all of them and say, you know, what did what nugget did you get from Brad Brown? Right. You know, I think it's um, it is an incredible thing to have um, purpose in your life that raises up that next generation and that um, shares your character with other people. And you've taught so many people um, what it looks like to be mature and to be um, respectful of others, to love others deeply to value the lives that are around you. Just know that you have so many people that love you and we're so thankful for you. Thank you for doing this with me on a Friday um, when you could be doing other things. Just, um, I appreciate what you are, um, the wisdom that you have shared and it's a wonderful way to wrap up this series. So thank you for your time. Absolutely. Thanks for giving me the chance, Corey. And you know, I, I don't know, I guess um, it means a lot to me that you care enough to reach out and, and listen to what an old dude has to say about life. Um, and, uh, you know, it you've done tremendous things for all the families and what you continue to do is really inspiring, I think, to everyone around you. So thanks for doing this. And I, I hope it's helpful to someone in some way. If no, nothing else, somebody hears it and says, hey, you know, um, I'm going to I'm going to reach out to somebody that I was with and that I know and I haven't talked to in a while and just talk to them and tell them I care about them um, because in the end that's all we have is each other.